Chapter 5 of The Ghost Pirates by William Hope Hodgson. This is recording is in the public domain. The Ghost Pirates. Chapter 5. The End of Wind. As I have said, there was a lot of talk among the crowd of us forward about Tom's strange accident. None of the men knew that Williams and I had seen it happen. Stubbins gave it as his opinion that Tom had been sleepy and missed the foot rope. Tom, of course, would not have this by any means. Yet he had no one to appeal to. For at that time he was just as ignorant as the rest, that we had seen the sail flap up over the yard. Stubbins insisted that it stood to reason it couldn't be the wind. There wasn't any, he said, and the rest of the men agreed with him. Well, I said, I don't know about all that. I'm a bit inclined to think Tom's yarn is the truth. How do you make that out? Stubbins asked unbelievingly. There ain't nothing like enough wind. What about the place on his forehead? I inquired in turn. How are you going to explain that? I expect he knocked himself there when he slipped, he answered. Likely Nuffly, agreed old Jasket, who was sitting smoking on a chest nearby. Well, you're both a damn long way out of it, Tom chipped in, pretty warm. I wasn't asleep, and the sail did bloomin' well hit me. Don't you be impertinent, young feller, said Jasket. I joined in again. There's another thing, Stubbins, I said. The gasket Tom was hanging by was on the after side of the yard. That looks as if the sail might have flapped it over, and if there were wind enough to do the one, it seems to me that it might have done the other. Do you mean that it was under the yard, or over the top? he asked. Over the top, of course. What's more, the foot of the sail was hanging over the after part of the yard in a bite. Stubbins was plainly surprised at that, and before he was ready with his next objection, Plummer spoke. Who saw it? he asked. I saw it, I said a bit sharply. So did Williams. So, for that matter, did the second mate. Plummer relapsed into silence and smoked, and Stubbins broke out afresh. I reckon Tom must have had a hold of the foot and the gasket, and pulled him over the yard when he tumbled. No, interrupted Tom. The gasket was under the sail. I couldn't even see it and I hadn't time to get hold of the foot of the sail before it up and caught me smack in the face. How did you get hold of the gasket when you fell then? asked Plummer. He didn't get hold of it, I answered for Tom. It had taken a turn round his wrist, and that's how we found him hanging. Do you mean to say as he hadn't got hold of the gasket? Coyne inquired, pausing in the lighting of his pipe. Of course I do, I said. A chap doesn't go hanging onto a rope when he's jolly well been knocked senseless. You're right, assented Jock. You're quite right there, Jessop. Coyne concluded the lighting of his pipe. I dunno, he said. I went on without noticing him. Anyway, when Williams and I found him, he was hanging by the gasket, and it had a couple of turns round his wrist. And besides that, as I said before, the foot of the sail was hanging over the after side of the yard, and Tom's weight on the gasket was holding it there. It's damn queer, said Stubbins in a puzzled voice. There don't seem to be no way of getting a proper explanation to it. I glanced at Williams to suggest that I should tell all that we had seen, but he shook his head, and after a moment's thought, it seemed to me that there was nothing to be gained by doing so. We had no very clear idea of the thing that had happened, and our half-facts and guesses would only have tended to make the matter appear more grotesque and unlikely. The only thing to be done was to wait and watch. If we could only get hold of something tangible, then we might hope to tell all that we knew, without being made into laughingstocks. I came out of my think abruptly. Stubbins was speaking again. He was arguing the matter with one of the other men. You see, with there being no wind, scarcely, there are things impossible, and yet... The other man interrupted with some remark I did not catch. 
No, I heard Stubbins say. I'm out of my reckoning. I don't savvy it one bit. It's too much like a damn fairy tale. Look at his wrist, I said. Tom held out his right hand and arm for inspection. It was considerably swollen where the rope had been round it. Yes, admitted Stubbins. That's right enough. But it don't tell you nothing. I made no reply. As Stubbins said, it told you nothing. And there I let it drop. Yet I have told you this, as showing how the matter was regarded in the forecastle. Still, it did not occupy our minds very long, for, as I have said, there were further developments. The three following nights passed quietly, and then, on the fourth, all those curious signs and hints culminated suddenly in something extraordinarily grim. Yet everything had been so subtle and intangible, and indeed, so was the affair itself, that only those who had actually come in touch with the invading fear seemed really capable of comprehending the terror of the thing. The men, for the most part, began to say the ship was unlucky, and of course, as usual, there was some talk of there being a Jonah in the ship. Still, I cannot say that none of the men realized there was anything horrible and frightening in it all, for I am sure that some did, a little, and I think Stubbins was certainly one of them, though I feel certain that he did not at the time, you know, grasp a quarter of the real significance that underlay the several queer matters that had disturbed our nights. He seemed to fail somehow to grasp the element of personal danger that to me was already plain. He lacked sufficient imagination, I suppose, to piece the things together, to trace the natural sequence of the events and their development. Yet I must not forget, of course, that he had no knowledge of those two first incidents. If he had, perhaps, he might have stood where I did. As it was, he had not seemed to reach out at all, you know, not even in the matter of Tom and the Four Royal. Now, however, after the thing I'm about to tell you, he seemed to see a little way into the darkness and realize possibilities. I remembered the fourth night well. It was a clear, starlit, moonless sort of night. At least, I think there was no moon. Or at any rate, the moon could have been little more than a thin crescent, for it was near the dark time. The wind had breezed up a bit, but still remained steady. We were slipping along at about six or seven knots an hour. It was our middle watch on deck, and the ship was full of the blow and hum of the wind aloft. Williams and I were the only ones about the main deck. He was leaning over the weather pinrail, smoking, while I was pacing up and down between him and the forehatch. Stubbins was on the lookout. Two bells had gone some minutes, and I was wishing to goodness that it was eight and time to turn in. Suddenly, overhead, there sounded a sharp crack, like the report of a rifle shot. It was followed instantly by the rattle and crash of sailcloth thrashing in the wind. Williams jumped away from the rail and ran aft a few steps. I followed him, and together we stared upwards to see what had gone. Indistinctly, I made out that the weather sheet of the fore to gallant had carried away and the clue of the sail was whirling and banging about in the air, and every few moments hitting the steel yard a blow, like the thump of a great sledgehammer. It's the shackle, or one of the links that's gone, I think, I shouted to Williams, above the noise of the sail. That's the spectacle that's hitting the yard. Yes, he shouted back, and went to get hold of the clue line. I ran to give him a hand. At the same moment, I caught the second mate's voice away aft, shouting. Then came the noise of running feet, and the rest of the watch and the second mate were with us almost at the same moment. In a few minutes, we had the yard lowered and the sail clued up. Then Williams and I went aloft to see where the sheet had gone. It was much as I had supposed. The spectacle was all right, but the pin had gone out of the shackle and the shackle itself was jammed into the sheave hole in the yard arm. William sent me down for another pin while he unbent the clue line and overhauled it down to the sheet. When I returned with a fresh pin, I screwed it into the shackle, clipped on the clue line, and sung out to the men to take a pull on the rope. 
as they did, and at the second heave the shackle came away. When it was high enough, I went up on to the tagallet yard and held the chain, while William shackled it into the spectacle. Then he bent on the clue line afresh and sung out to the second mate that we were ready to hoist away. "'You'd better go down and give him a all,' he said. "'I'll sty and light up the sile.' "'Right ho, Williams,' I said, getting into the rigging. "'Don't let the ship's bogey run away with you.' This remark I made in a moment of light-heartedness, such as will come to anyone aloft at times. I was exhilarated for the time being, and quite free from the sense of fear that had been with me so much of late. I suppose this was due to the freshness of the wind. "'There's more than one,' he said, in that curiously short way of his. "'What?' I asked. He repeated his remark. I was suddenly serious. The reality of all the impossible details of the past weeks came back to me, vivid and beastly. "'What do you mean, Williams?' I asked him. But he had shut up and would say nothing. "'What do you know? How much do you know?' I went on quickly. "'Why did you never tell me that you—' The second mate's voice interrupted me abruptly. "'Now then, up there, are you going to keep us waiting all night? One of you come down and give us a pull on the halyards, and the other stay up and light up the gear.' "'Aye, aye, sir,' I shouted back. Then I turned to Williams hurriedly. "'Look here, Williams,' I said. "'If you think there is really a danger in your being alone up here—' I hesitated for words to express what I meant. Then I went on. "'Well, I'll jolly well stay up with you.' The second mate's voice came again. "'Come on now, one of you! Make a move! What the hell are you doing?' "'Coming, sir!' I sung out. "'Shall I stay?' I asked definitely. "'Garn,' he said. "'Don't you fret yourself. I'll take her bloomin' pie-dye out of her. Brorst em. I ain't funky of em. I went. That was the last word William spoke to anyone living. I reached the decks and tailed on to the halyards. We had nearly mastheaded the yard, and the second mate was looking up at the dark outline of the sail, ready to sing out belay when all at once there came a queer sort of muffled shout from Williams. "'Vast hauling you men!' shouted the second mate. We stood silent and listened. "'What's that, Williams?' he sung out. "'Are you all clear?' For nearly half a minute we stood listening, but there came no reply. Some of the men said afterwards that they had noticed a curious rattling and vibrating noise aloft that sounded faintly above the hum and swirl of the wind. Like the sound of loose ropes being shaken and slatted together, you know. Whether this noise was really heard, or whether it was something that had no existence outside of their imaginations, I cannot say. I heard nothing of it, but then I was at the tail end of the rope, and furthest from the fore-rigging, while those who heard it were on the fore part of the halyards and close up to the shrouds. The second mate put his hands to his mouth. "'Are you all clear there?' he shouted again. The answer came, unintelligible and unexpected. It ran like this. "'Blarst you! I stied! Did you think? Drive! Bl pie die And then there was a sudden silence. I stared up at the dim sail, astonished. "'He's dotty said Stubbins, who had been told to come off the lookout and give us a pull. "'He's as mad as a bloomin' adder,' said Queen, who was standing foresight of me. "'He's been queer all along.' "'Silence there!' shouted the second mate. Then, "'Williams!' No answer. "'Williams!' more loudly. Still no answer. Then, "'Damn you!' You jumped up, cockney crocodile! Can't you hear? Are you blooming well deaf? There was no answer, and the second mate turned to me. Jump aloft smartly now, Jessop, and see what's wrong. Aye, aye, sir, I said, and made a run for the rigging. I felt a bit queer. Had Williams gone mad? He certainly always had been a bit funny. Or, and the thought came with a jump, had he seen 
I did not finish. Suddenly, up aloft, there sounded a frightful scream. I stopped, with my hand on the shear pole. The next instant, something fell out of the darkness, a heavy body that struck the deck near the waiting men with a tremendous crash and a loud, ringing, wheezy sound that sickened me. Several of the men shouted out loud in their fright and let go of the halyards. But luckily, the stopper held it and the yard did not come down. Then, for the space of several seconds, there was a dead silence among the crowd and it seemed to me that the wind had in it a strange moaning note. The second mate was the first to speak. His voice came so abruptly that it startled me. Get a light, one of you, quick now! There was a moment's hesitation. Fetch one of the binnacle lamps, you, Tammy. Aye, aye, sir, the youngster said in a quavering voice and ran aft. In less than a minute, I saw the light coming towards us along the deck. The boy was running. He reached us and handed the lamp to the second mate, who took it and went towards the dark, huddled heap on the deck. He held the light out before him and peered at the thing. My God, he said, it's Williams. He stooped lower with the light and I saw details. It was Williams right enough. The second mate told a couple of the men to lift him and straighten him out on the hatch. Then he went aft to call the skipper. He returned in a couple of minutes with an old ensign which he spread over the poor beggar. Almost directly, the captain came hurrying forward along the decks. He pulled back one end of the ensign and looked. Then he put it back quietly, and the second mate explained all that we knew in a few words. "'Would you leave him where he is, sir?' he asked, after he had told everything. "'The night's fine,' said the captain. "'You may as well leave the poor devil there.' He turned and went aft slowly. The man who was holding the light swept it round so that it showed the place where Williams had struck the deck. The second mate spoke abruptly. Get a broom and a couple of buckets, some of you. He turned sharply and ordered Tammy onto the poop. As soon as he had seen the yard mastheaded and the ropes cleared up, he followed Tammy. He knew well enough that it would not do for the youngster to let his mind dwell too much on the poor chap on the hatch, and I found out, a little later, that he gave the boy something to occupy his thoughts. After they had gone aft, we went into the forecastle. Everyone was moody and frightened. For a little while, we sat about in our bunks and on the chests, and no one said a word. The watch below were all asleep, and not one of them knew what had happened. All at once, Plummer, whose wheel it was, stepped over the starboard washboard into the forecastle. "'What's up, anyway?' he asked. "'Is Williams much hurt?' "'Shh,' I said. "'You'll wake the others. Who's taking your wheel?' "'Tammy. Their second sent him. He said I could go forward and have her smoke. He said Williams had had her fall.' He broke off and looked across the forecastle. "'Where is he?' he inquired in a puzzled voice. I glanced at the others, but no one seemed inclined to start yarning about it. He fell from the Tagalog rigging, I said. Where is he? he repeated. Smashed up, I said. He's lying on the hatch. Dead? he asked. I nodded. I guessed were something pretty bad when I saw the old man come forward. How did it happen? He looked round at the lot of us sitting there silent and smoking. No one knows, I said, and glanced at Stubbins. I caught him eyeing me doubtfully. After a moment's silence, Plummer spoke again. I heard him screech when I was at the wheel. He must have got hurt up aloft. Stubbins struck a match and proceeded to relight his pipe. How do you mean? he asked, speaking for the first time. How do I mean? Well, I can't say. Maybe he jammed his fingers between the peril and the mast. What about his swearing at their second mate? Was that cause he jammed his fingers? Put in coin. I never heard about that, said Plummer. Who heard him? I should think everybody on the bloomin' ship heard him, Stubbins answered. All they're saying, I ain't sure he was swearing at their second mate. I thought at first he'd gone dotty and was cousin him. But somehow, it don't seem likely, now I come to think. 
It don't stand a reason he should go to cuss the man. There was nothing to go cussing about. What's more, he didn't seem to be talking down to us on deck. What I could make out. Besides, what would he want to go talking to the second about his payday? He looked across to where I was sitting. Jock, who was smoking quietly on the chest next to me, took his pipe slowly out from between his teeth. You're no far out, Stubbins, I'm thinking. You're no far out, he said, nodding his head. Stubbins still continued to gaze at me. What's your ID? he said abruptly. It may have been my fancy, but it seemed to me that there was something deeper than the mere sense the question conveyed. I glanced at him. I couldn't have said myself just what my idea was. I don't know, I answered, a little adrift. He didn't strike me as cursing the second mate. That is, I should say, after the first minute. Just what I say, he replied. Another thing, don't it strike you as being bloomin' queer about Tom nearly coming down by her run, and then this? I nodded. It would have been all up with Tom if it hadn't been for the gasket. He paused. After a moment, he went on again. That was only three or four nights ago. Well, said Plummer, what are you driving at? Nothing, answered Stubbins. Only it's damned queer. Looks as though their ship might be unlucky after all. Well, agreed Plummer, things has been a bit funny lately. And then there's what's happened tonight. I shall hang on pretty tight the next time I go aloft. Old Jaska took his pipe from his mouth and sighed. Things is going wrong most every night, he said, almost pathetically. It's as different as chalk and cheese to what it were when we started this here trip. I thought it were all Elish rot about her being haunted, but it's not seemly. He stopped and expectorated. She ain't haunted, said Stubbins. Leastways, not like you mean. He paused, as though trying to grasp some elusive thought. Eh? said Jaskett in the interval. Stubbins continued without noticing the query. He appeared to be answering some half-formed thought in his own brain, rather than Jaskett. Things is queer, and it's been a bad job tonight. I don't savvy one bit what Williams was saying of up aloft. I've thought sometimes he'd something on his mind. Then, after a pause of about half a minute, he said this. Who was he saying that to? Eh? said Jaskett again, with a puzzled expression. I was thinking, said Stubbins, knocking out his pipe on the edge of the chest. Perhaps you're right, after all. End of chapter 5